The point about chemistry, absolutely wrong. Uh, the nice thing about informational models is that it doesn't uh, need only sort of a substrate of electronics or mechanics or whatever, but it can incorporate the chemical nature of, of the brain. It's terribly important. We, we do a lot of work on uh, emotion, and emotions are entirely chemically based in, in the brain, and we talk about dopamine kit. But in the model, it may be just a signal. So it certainly isn't ignored, and it's terribly important. Um, then um, there is the question of rules. Um, an informational machine is not founded on a set of finite rules. That is a misconception. It comes out of 60 years of artificial intelligence, where people have been writing rules in order to make computers smart. Okay. People who are interested in informational machines are particularly interested in the way in which the function of the system is built up as a result of experience. And 90% of it is not explicitable rules, and yet they're able to use it um, in a totally functional way. So, you know, if you want to read about the technology of that, the, the thing to do is to, uh, I don't know, is, is, is to read emergent properties from systems, is to read complexity, is to read um, uh, neural systems possibly. Uh, but your, your, your example is a very, very good uh, sort of counter-argument to why artificial intelligence doesn't work. But that's not what we do. Um, going a little further back on the, on the private question, the private question, the answer is more or less the same. That it is totally possible to create a private element in, uh, in a technological system, particularly through the route of evolutionary computation. Uh, there are a lot of systems that are built, that are built through a, a system of evolution so that the, the, the way that the, uh, the mechanics organize themselves is uh, as, as a best fit on behavior. But from behavior, you cannot infer what it is that this machine has ended up with in the end. And it does have very much a private uh, side, which many engineers who built this evolutionary system would give a great deal to be able to crack and to, to encode. So it's not all that many miles away from trying to infer the private side of a living human being from, from behavior, which, which is almost impossible. So we have, we, we have very similar parallels. We have all, almost um, assume that when you build a machine, the word machine sort of comes up in neon lights. It's something a computer that a scientist has built or an engineer has built and it's totally understood. No, we sometimes have to rely entirely on these emergent properties. We know roughly how they work, but they, they create a private world for this, this system in much the same way as in living world. Organism. Uh, finally, if I can deal with Casper, <laughs> um, I think that starting again backwards, human nature. I picked on the physiological character of, of, of a human because without it, you don't have human nature. But uh, I, I, I worry a little about umbrella terms. Uh, I, I don't understand fully what human nature is, and I guess that's why it's interesting. <laughs> uh, but it does seem to me that uh, it can be changed radically through some uh, physical change. Um, the way people interact or interact with animals or objects can be changed drastically by, by physical changes, but it takes a very long time to, to do that. And going backwards to that, uh, I, I don't think I actually said that uh, one can model skepticism, but I do hope that people are skeptical. It wouldn't be too, too great a, a, a problem. This whole business of modeling has to do with asking, okay, someone's skeptical, um, or someone has imagination. 
What does that mean in terms of an informational machine? What, what is an informational machine doing which would lead us to believe that it could have imagination? There's a lot of work that's being done on that the work of Murray Shanahan, Bernard Bars, and so on. And you know, there's a whole field about the imaginational machine. I haven't come across a field of skeptical machines yet, <laughs> although I think most of them probably are. <laughs> Uh, the question of what I'm advocating, my general, uh, my general stance has usually been a libertarian stance, sympathetic to transhumanism. But if, you, if you're asking me which I think will prevail, I think that religious conservative views will prevail over that because they're more communitarian and uh, for demographic reasons. An interesting demographer called Eric uh, Kaufman at Birkbeck College has calculated quite convincingly to me that Britain will stop being a secular society and will become religious society for in the next few decades due to differential reproduction and immigration of religious people. So that's the view I think will probably empirically prevail. Um, in terms of uh, human nature, I think human nature differs. If we are unequal, men and women have different human nature. Uh, people of different ages, from children through adult life into old age, have different human nature. And I think different genetic groups have different human nature. The new uh, SNP studies, where people are scanning their um, genomes, are able to identify people down to the level of a village in Switzerland. And we're going to be able to identify uh, people to that level of resolution by their genes. And these genes are going to affect the way you think. So you, I think we've just got to start getting used to the fact that genetic factors affect human nature. and Everybody in the world is not the same. Um, the, the, this uh, man here asked whether I thought that things, people had changed in the past 2,000 years. Yes, I think there's a huge amount of empirical evidence. If you accept this view, uh, which I only have changed to in the last couple of years, that human nature is, is more changing more easily than we thought. Several evolutionary psychologists have made this change, including Steven Pinker, um, in the last couple of years. People have changed their mind. We all used to think that every human in the world was essentially identical, and now people are changing their mind and saying that it's much more malleable than was thought. Um, the work of Gregory Clark at University of California, Davis, suggests that human nature changed in England in the Middle Ages, in a few hundred years, and that was a key factor in allowing the Industrial Revolution. Things like this are, are coming through, and I've been essentially convinced by this kind of evidence that I think, I think there are significant changes, but, but it's a quantitative thing. It's obviously not a difference like a difference between dogs and cats, but it's a more moving human nature one direction or another.